I'd like to give you an announcement, a very long announcement, about uh, the rules of fasting and abstinence. The rules of fasting and abstinence, which are useful for Lent. And in fact, it's most of the sermon, this announcement. So when it starts getting long, don't worry, it's most of the sermon. So first of all, what is fasting and abstinence, and why do we do it? The definition of fasting is, according to the traditional manuals of moral theology, means taking only one full meal per day. In practice, the church allows one full meal and two small meals, or what they call collations, which when combined do not equal a full meal. And then what is the law of abstinence that has to do with not eating meat? By abstinence, abstinence is meant that one abstains from meat, and this is flesh meat of warm-blooded animals. The other kind of meat is what they call not flesh meat, means that fish is allowed, and that's the animals whose blood is cold. So why do we fast and abstain? Our Lord answers that question for us in Luke chapter 13, verse 5. He says, Unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. So to um, further expound those words of our Lord, we fast and we abstain because we are sinners. Justice requires each of us to make recompense to God for the honor we have denied him by our sins. We fast and, do, and abstain because we have misused our goods, our souls and our bodies, as well as those of others. The natural law itself requires us to strive to restore the order we have disturbed by our sins. And finally, we fast and we abstain in order to help us fulfill this requirement, Holy Mother Church, knowing our weakness and our laziness, binds us under ecclesiastical laws to perform works of penance at certain times. And Lent is certainly one of those times. So I give you some practical points. You might be wondering then, what kind of penance are we expected to do or ordered to do during Lent? What is actually actually required under pain of sin during Lent? What are the minimum obligations? And the honest answer is, unfortunately, not very much. Almost shamefully little is required. Basically, the only thing required in this country is, fasting means eating considerably less than the normal amount. End of uh, rule. Fasting means eating considerably less than the normal amount. Unfortunately, as you can see, that doesn't make clear what we are to do. The new law of discipline is sadly not very precise. So everything I just told you about one full meal and two other snacks allowed, as long as together they don't add up to one meal, and, um, that's not practiced anymore, or let's say it's not a law anymore, but you can still do it. As to abstinence from meat, it is only required to not eat meat on Ash Wednesday and the Fridays of Lent. So that is not too difficult. Um, and by the way, uh, especially uh, during Lent, we don't eat meat on Fridays, but we should try our best to practice that all year long, as Catholics used to practice that. And also, the church calendar, the universal church calendar, says that only these days of Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are the days that we absolutely must uh, fast and abstain from meat. So therefore, in practice, and I give you this as something which is a counsel, a recommendation, but it is not obligatory. Therefore, in practice, we usually advise Catholics to eat one main meal each day. And it doesn't matter what time of day you want to eat this meal. And if they absolutely require it, they may eat a snack 
at another time of the day, such as a bowl of soup or bread and butter or some other light food. And notice I'm saying only one snack besides the main meal. So by the way, this is just as hard for me as it is for you. I'll see if I can live up to my words. But one full meal, and then maybe you can have a snack at other, some other time of the day. This is a good rule to keep for the fasting of Lent. We also advise on days except Fridays to eat meat only once a day, and that's at the main meal. So there's some rules for you on fasting and abstinence, which really are most of the sermon. I'll continue with a few other words just to give a little bit of uh, spirit, or a little bit of form to all these words of matter and material that I just gave you. So we read in the encyclical of Pope Benedict XIV from the beginning of his pontif pontificate in 1741, the following. He was making a protest about the situation he found in the Catholic world when he began his pontificate. He said, the observance of Lent is the very badge of the Christian warfare. By it, we prove ourselves not to be enemies of the cross of Christ. By it, we avert the scourges of divine justice. By it, we gain strength against the princes of darkness, for it shields us with heavenly help. Should mankind grow remiss in their observance of Lent, it would be a detriment to God's glory. I got to repeat that line. Should mankind go, grow remiss in his observance of Lent, it would be a detriment to God's glory, a disgrace to the Catholic religion, and a danger to Christian souls. Neither can it be doubted that such negligence would become the source of misery to the world, or public calamity and private woe. This prince of the church is simply reiterating the words of the master, unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. Very good. So just studying those words a little bit. If we don't fast, we're going to take something away from God's glory. You might say, well, what's the connection between not fasting and somehow defrauding, of, defrauding God of something that belongs to him? Well, the answer is we sin, we sin and we are sinners. So we're, we're taking God's glory away from him by our sins. But when we fast... We're offering up to God reparation for our sins or, or penance for our sins. And we're saying, please, we didn't mean to do that. And I'll show you that I didn't mean to do that by allowing some suffering to happen to me, some voluntary suffering. And it's not, certainly not harmful suffering. Some might even say that the fasting is, is good for the body. It needs to be cleared out every couple times a year for 40 days straight and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's, we're not doing any harm to the body. But we are uh, feeling the, the pain, and just as we sort of ca cause God pain by our sins. So by doing the fasting, we're giving God back his glory. By doing the fasting, we're giving God glory. When we take it away, we're cheating God of some of the glory that he deserves. To not fast would be a disgrace to the Catholic religion. Uh, and I know I've said this several times with you already, but if you have some um, a contact, uh, interplay, some word like that, with non-Catholic Christians, you'll find that they don't believe in fasting. Generally, there are exceptions. And they say, you know, you Catholics are always con concentrating on negative things, and you think that you sort of score brownie points with God by doing negative things to yourself. They have that prejudice about us. And they have to insist on that prejudice about it, about us, otherwise they'll end up becoming Catholics, and they certainly don't want to do that. So, um, when we compare a Catholic to a, a non-Catholic Christian, a Protestant, they're ob it's obvious, they're set in their ways, they're not going to do penance because Christianity is all about the resurrection. It's all about joy, and it's all about how Christ has conquered death and sin, and uh, they never go through all the suffering with Christ to help him con conquer death and sin. Now, if you and I were to sort of adopt this Protestant attitude of man doesn't deserve to be punished anymore, he should just rejoice in God's resurrection, we're going to leave our Lord himself, our Lord by himself, hanging on the cross without doing our Christian duty. 
We are baptized into the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he paid the price for sin on the cross 2,000 years ago for a three-hour period, he had all of us in mind. And he was inviting all of us to share in that same suffering with him, which is the greatest prayer that has ever been offered. Now, if you or I come along 2,000 years later and say, well, I'm so glad he offered up all that suffering and was victorious against sin and eventually victorious against death, um, I'm just going to sort of revel in that glory, revel in that victory of him and, and leave it at that. No, 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 no. We are baptized into the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning he gives us life by incorporating us into his sufferings on the cross. Every time we reject sin or fight against our bad tendencies, we are participating in the cross of our Lord. So when it comes to doing penance, once in a while, it's the same thing. We're being incorporated into, incorporated into the sufferings of our Lord. We are helping him make the greatest prayer he ever made to his Father on Calvary. And we are helping him to redeem souls. I know it's a huge mystery. It makes us think that we're somehow divine, but we are not. Well, say, I'm sorry. He shares his divine life with us. So, yes, we are somehow divine in that sense. And since we're here as kind of extensions of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to share with us that greatest prayer he ever made to his Father, which is his suffering. So it would be a disgrace to the Catholic religion if we did not fast during Lent and also abstain from meat with the rules I just gave you. And it's a danger to Christian souls to not fast, and to not abstain. Because you see, my dear faithful, we know what our tendencies are. We get full of ourselves. And when we get full of ourselves, we forget about God. And we make mistakes. And we harm our neighbor. We might even harm ourselves. It's our tendency. The human being of all animals is the most selfish creature on the face of the earth. And by having the faith, the Catholic faith, with all the sacraments and the life of grace, we're constantly curbing that selfishness and taking it away from ourselves. It would be a danger to Christian souls if we did not fast, if we did not abstain from meat, because we would let ourselves just keep getting that, that idea, I'm the best, I deserve this, I, I, I have an entitlement to more glory, I don't know what the thing is. We're just so full of ourselves we would continue to offend God. We would continue to offend our neighbor. We would trip on our own ego. It would be a danger to our Christian soul to not fast and to not abstain. And then as the Pope, uh, Benedict XIV of the year 1741, uh, con continues and finishes, neither can it be doubted that such negligence, not fasting, not abstain, abstaining during Lent, would become the source of misery to the world, of public calamity, and of private woe. Uh, unless I'm just a doomsday prophet or something like that, if I'm not mistaken, in the last 50 or 60 years, there has been more unrest in the world than before uh, in different ways. And uh, sure enough, wouldn't you know it, just about 50 or 60 years ago is when the Catholic Church let down her guard on making opposition against the world. Cooled it on the, all the fasting laws, all the abstinence laws, until there's just about nothing left. There's a connection here. You know, when people are saying their prayers and making their penances and so forth, God has mercy on this world. When they stop praying, when they stop doing penance, God lets the earthquakes continue and the wars continue and everything we pray that doesn't happen, it happens. Because man is not appeasing God by doing penance. And so God lets the disasters and the wars happen uh, because um, it puts man back on his knees again. It's actually his mercy to let the wars continue and let the volcanoes erupt or whatever the thing is. Uh, do penance, fast, abstain, because otherwise it would be a source of misery to the world, of public calamity, and of our own private woe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.